Never throw away an empty ballpoint pen case, but convert it into the all-purpose 13 centimetre ruler. Well, it doesn't it look uh, terribly useful to you. It's only got four measurements on yeah, it. Yeah, well, you'll find that a lot of pen cases are very close to 13 centimetres. If they're a little longer, cut them back a fraction. This one's exactly 13. You'll notice I've made marks at the one centimetre, two, six and ten centimetre marks. Well, one, two, six, ten and thirteen I could measure, but what about Oh, seven you can and measure eight. anything. I didn't bother putting those in because it would be a waste of ink. Wow. <laughs> well, look, if you want one centimetre, it's there for you. Right. If you want two centimetres, that's there. If you want three, well, just come up to the other end. From ten up to thirteen will give you oh, three. I see. Can you find four hidden away there? Well, all right. That, well, four would be ten minus the six. That's right, or six minus two. Right. What about five? Uh, five, that's, uh, well, six minus the one would give you five. Okay, and six? Uh, well, six is already there. It is, isn't it? the end it? of the six. How about seven? That's a little more difficult. Um, Remember, it's 13 centimetres long. What about six plus a one? Or can't oh, no, no, you must do it in one shot. All right, well, th well 13 yes. minus six would give you seven. And you've got seven, yeah. How about eight? Uh, eight, what about ten minus the two? You have it. And nine? Well, add one. Ten? Well, that's or there. One more. Eleven? Eleven. Uh... What about 13 minus the 2? That's it. And then 12? Well, add one. one. And 13, of the course, is the whole yeah. thing. Isn't that and neat? you can make one of those out of a piece of cardboard or wood, an ice cream stick, anything. again. Have you ever tried to cut a pipe square or a piece of dowling? You start off, you think you're going square, but when you finish, it's going crooked and you've got a point on it. Or if you've got a wide pipe, you start on one side, you keep going round, by the time you get to the place where you first started, you've gone off course again. It's not square at all. Well, the obvious answer is to mark the pipe out. So you set it down there, you get your pen, hold it, you think, in the right position, rotate the pipe, but you lose track of the line, and when it finally gets round to where you started, again, you've gone off course. So how do you cut a pipe square? Hi there, this is Smack of It's Given. Have a listen to a few of the tracks on my party album. The boys and I had a ball doing it. Don't, 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 see, don't cry. I found my thrill. Smacker's Party Album buys you a happy time with all these 18 tracks. Available at record stores now. Cassette or disc only $4.98. Smacker's Party Album. Get a copy soon. What is the solution to cutting a pipe square? Very simply, a piece of paper with a straight edge. This is what you do. First of all, wrap it tightly around the pipe or the dowling, whatever it is that's round that you have to cut. And not only tight, it's got to be with the edge overlapping itself. So you keep tugging and pulling to keep it tight against the pipe and adjust those edges so they run over each other. And when they do, that forms a perfect ruler for what you want. There we are. Get your pen and just run it around the edge of that paper like this. And you'll find that when that line meets up with itself, you can take the paper away, and it's exactly in the right position. Then you can get your saw, cut along that line, and you'll be able to cut your pipe square.
lovely sunny day at the beach, calm water, hardly anyone around, and a stone. I guess you've done this many times before, at the beach or maybe at a lake or a river. Are you ready? Flat stones often work very well. You may even get them to skip several times over the water. Big heavy round stones on the other hand are often duds. They don't even skip at all. Well the success of stone skipping depends on three things. One, the surface of the water. Two, the stone you choose. And three, the way you throw it. Let's see why. The surface of the water acts like a stretched sheet of rubber and it's difficult to penetrate. There's the surface, here's the water underneath. Imagine that somebody throws a stone from directly above. There we are. That arrow represents the force with which the stone is thrown. All of that force will be used to penetrate the surface of the water and it'll go right through without any problems. Now, if you throw a stone with the same force from an angle, like this, the amount of that force that's used to penetrate is much less. In fact, it's this amount here coming down from the beginning of the arrow to the surface of the water. Not as much, less likely to penetrate, but it'll probably still go through. However, if you throw a stone from a very shallow angle like this, same force, so we'll use an arrow of the same length, the amount of that force that's used to penetrate is very small. It's only that tiny bit there. And because the surface of the water is like a stretched sheet of rubber, it's more likely that the stone will bounce off rather than penetrate. Now it also depends on the stone you choose, as I said, and a flatter one works better, as you know. The reason for this is that a flat stone, when it hits the surface of the water, spreads that force out over a larger area. So the amount of pressure is less from a flat stone than from a big fat one. It's a bit like a pin bouncing off the surface of a balloon. What, you say? How could a pin bounce off a balloon? Well, it can do that if it comes to the surface at a very shallow angle. There, just like the stone bouncing off the surface of the water. I'm pushing with a reasonable force. What happens if I push with the same force and come directly from above? Just like the stone that didn't skip. You can be a fantastic designer, and it doesn't require much, only a bit of plastic from a shirt box, even a plastic bag will do, and the sort of felt pen that has a nice fine tip, a pair of compasses, a ruler, and some paper. That's all you need. Let me show you why. Let's get rid of most of this and uh, start with the ruler, the felt pen, and the plastic. Go carefully and rule yourself a whole lot of parallel lines. The closer together the better, but make them as regular as you can. Parallel and close together. It takes a while, but if you take some care, you'll end up with something that looks rather like this. And you can either rule another bit of plastic like that, or produce the same sort of rulings on a piece of paper. And a photocopy, I might say, is a quick way to do it. Put one over the other and move it a bit. And lo and behold, you've generated a whole lot of new patterns like that. Well, those are parallel straight lines. Let's try parallel circular ones. Again, get your plastic up there. Get the sort of felt pen that'll fit inside a pair of compasses. It's about as thin as a pencil. And open your compasses and draw a circle. Again, close them up or open them, but keep those lines 
regularly spaced and as close together as you can. You get a whole lot of concentric circles and when you place those over themselves and move them you get a whole lot of interesting new patterns like that. But of course you're not only limited to those, you can get a bit of cardboard for example and by placing your acetate there or your plastic there position the piece of cardboard, rule along its edge again as regular and as close as you can get them and you'll find very interesting patterns generated by that and its double. Here we go, under there. Turn it around and you find new patterns all the way around. Well, what are these new patterns that you're inventing? In fact, you didn't invent them. They are described as moiré patterns. They've been known for hundreds of years. Moiré is the French word for watered, and they're first seen in watered silk. You may have noticed if you put one piece of silk over another, if you ever get your hands on it, you see these patterns. Flywire is very good. In fact, anything which is a regular repeated pattern over another regular repeated pattern will give you moiré patterns. In fact, even on your own television screen, if I put that horizontally, because you've got horizontal lines in your television screen, you can see just faint moiré patterns in your own television set there. You may have noticed it when people wear the wrong sort of clothes on television. You get moiré patterns all over their suits. Well, what use are they? Scientists use them, in fact, for analysing the weather and lenses and all sorts of things. But hundreds of years ago, before the advent of uh, moving pictures as we know them, they were used for magic moving picture books. Have a look at this. Open it up, there's a picture of a traction engine. Watch carefully and suddenly the wheels start to move. And the smoke billows out of the smokestack and everything is uh, trundling along at great speed. Well, what happened there was that the book came to you with a grid. And it was ruled up very finely with lines. And there you can see them on there. And the diagram itself had very fine lines, very cunningly spaced. So when you put one over the other and moved it, you got moving moiré patterns. And that made the whole picture look as if it was moving. And the book was full of these. Well, you won't be able to rule yours as finely as that, although you can have a go. But even if you can't, with things as finely ruled as that, and a mixture of patterns, not always the same one over itself, you'll be able to generate very interesting mares indeed. And in fact, each one of them will be a new pattern. Here's a matchstick problem for all those who like matchstick problems. I have a bundle of matches here, and I'm going to put four of them into a square, a perfect square, and just a little distance apart I'll make another square. There we are. Now each of those squares will now be divided in halves with a match across the middle, like that and that. We now have one, two, three, four, five matches there, six, seven, eight, nine, ten matches all together. Can you think of a way of moving just three matches and ending up with five? Ten matches, move three, end up with five. Sounds impossible? I think I can do it. A signal from the Admiral of the Ford Fleet, Don Bowden. I want to talk to you about cash rebates. We introduced the new Ford cash rebate program during July. It was designed to stimulate the economy and keep the wheels of the motor industry rolling. I'm pleased to report that the cash rebate plan has worked at Bowden Ford. Yes, you, the car buyer, have responded and helped us in our Whip Inflation Now campaign. Therefore, I've decided it will continue. That's right, the cash rebate plan at Bowden Ford will continue. Now, what does this mean to you, the car purchaser? It means that you can still do a deal on the new Ford of your choice. And after you've taken delivery and had the car registered, I'll personally send you a cash rebate check. Here's what you get. $75 on an Escort, $100 on a Cortina, $150 on Falcon, $200 on Fairlane, and $300 on LTD and Landau. We're winning the fight. Cash rebates on new Fords will continue. You've shown you want it, and while you support it, we'll do it. Let's whip inflation now. Cash rebates on new Ford from Bowden Ford continue. The senior service fights on.
10 matches, move 3, end up with 5. Sounds impossible? I think I can do it. Well, of course, you can't do it if you use normal arithmetic. What you have to do is use a little trick. Have a look at this. Move three matches. All right, I'll start by moving that match and placing it there. Then I'll take this match away and I'll put that one there. Finally, I'll take this one and put it there. I had ten matches to begin with. Now I have F-I-V-E five. The human body is marvellously engineered and probably the most impressive part of it is the hand and the arm. But that gives us a problem. You see, I can hinge my hand up like that and I can hinge my elbow up like that. It's rather as if I'd made a cardboard arm and put the hinges on it. If I do that you can see there's a hinge at the wrist and a hinge at the elbow. Once I hinge them both, the whole thing is stuck there. I can't do anything else with it. It's a rigid construction, like three sides of a box. But my own arm isn't. I can hinge it up like that, but I can turn it around as well, completely unlike the cardboard arm. So there's a difference. And how is it that we don't really behave like the cardboard arm? What's really going on inside there to give me all those wonderful degrees of freedom that I use and you use every day? How is my forearm constructed to give me all those degrees of movement that I use and you use every day? Well, have another look. I said there's a hinge there, and there is, at the wrist. There's a hinge there, and there is too, at the elbow. But that's not the only kind of joint that we've got in the human body. Basically there are five, but the ones we're really interested in are not only hinges, like the elbow and the wrist and the jaw, but also pivots, where we spin one bone around another. And I've got both of those in operation in my forearm. So if I took this model of the arm and uh, showed you really how it works, it's rather like this. There's one bone up there, two bones down in the forearm. And if I disconnect that arm, you'll see how they operate. Certainly there's a hinge down there, but the bone that the hand hinges onto pivots at its other end. And there's a hinge at the elbow, but the bone involved pivots at its other end. So really, the two work like that. If we trot over and have a look at the skeleton, you'll see what I mean. The bones of this arm are now lying as they do in mine. So when I move my wrist, you can see there's a hinge on that bone there. Like that. But the other end of that bone has a pivot on it. So if I move my forearm like this, you can see that end of the bone is actually pivoting. Well, what about the other movement? This second bone here has a hinge there, and that's what I use when I bend my elbow. But you've probably guessed the other end of that bone will have a pivot on it, and it does, and it pivots at the wrist. Like that. And when you put the flesh back on, you have a hinge there, but a pivot there. A hinge there, but a pivot there. And that's how we get all those wonderful movements with our forearms. bags after you've finished eating potato chips or other nibbles? Well, you could throw them away or you could shrivel them. How do you do that? I'm glad you asked. You first of all do it by making sure that you have a very neat bag. Now, when you open a bag normally, you just rip the top off. Don't do it if you're going to shrivel them. Turn the bag over to the back and make a 
small incision with the scissors in the center and then slice along one side making sure that you don't damage the top all the way to one edge turn it over and slice it back to the other edge like so now you can remove the contents tip them into a plate and try and make sure that you get all the little scraps out shake it carefully like that then flatten it out as carefully as you can making sure not to tear it flatten it down like that and you're ready to shrivel it and what you'll need for that is an oven correct temperature now not all bags shrivel in the same way some work better than others some don't work at all I have three here that we're going to try there we are a green one an orange one and a red and yellow one so we'll take them over to the oven we'll place them in and we'll see what happens now make sure that mum and dad are helping you with this the oven should be set on about 400 degrees Fahrenheit or 200 degrees Celsius certainly no higher than that can be a bit lower if you like what you do is to place them in there and watch what happens through the glass door if you happen to have one the reason why they'll shrivel is because many of these bags are made of a kind of plastic that partially melts under the influence of heat I have my doubts about this one though because it feels like ordinary cellophane and that doesn't seem to work as well okay let's see what happens we open the door you'll need to have an oven tray in position there we are in about the center of the oven and we'll put the bags in these positions here slide the oven tray back close the door and watch through the glass After three or four minutes, the bags are ready to emerge. Now to take them out, use a pair of tongs and place them on a cool tray. There's the red and yellow one, the green one, and the orange one. Let's have a closer look at these. Now you'll notice that the red and yellow one is nicely shriveled. You can probably touch them by now, but they'll be hot. And if you want to flatten it out a little or change its shape, it'll be a little bit pliable. So you can do that if you work fast. Let's try the green one. Same with that. Look how that's shriveled. But what about the orange one? Didn't shrivel at all because, as I suspected, it's cellophane, not plastic. These were plastic. And if you want to, you can take them out of the oven when they're partially shriveled. Here are a couple that didn't go all the way. Now, once you've done that, what on earth are you going to do with them? Well, it's up to your imagination. You might, for example, if you use a buckle bag, like to uh, attach one of these little shriveled bags to one of the buckles. There we are, to match your kangaroos and drink containers and thongs and all the other things that you put on your buckle bags. Or if you're going to a party and you want to be a little bit different, why not wear a shriveled bag around your neck chain? Or perhaps you want to simply make a mobile and hang it in your bedroom. The sky is your limit. It's up to your imagination.
If you sew, crochet or knit, you need dot pattern. Why waste your money on paper patterns and ready-made clothes when you can make custom fitting patterns by using only two measurements and you could save hundreds of dollars on the latest fashions? Dot pattern is the complete drafting kit and includes enlarging scale, 50 basic patterns, French curve, tape measure, front and back armhole measure, set square and 59 sewing hints. Simple step-by-step -step instructions with clear detailed pictures show you how to make your own patterns in minutes. It's unbelievably easy and you could become your own fashion designer. With dot pattern you could save money and beat rising clothing prices. You'll be shown how to master special shortcuts and tricks the experts use to give garments that professional look. Dot pattern, just eight dollars. Also inquire about children's dot pattern. Time for matchbox magic. I have two matchboxes. One has matches in it, the other one is empty. And we're ready to do some magic. Mm -hmm. You believe me? No. <laughs> well, check me. All right. That one has, well, it does have matches. It does. Though. And the other one is absolutely that empty. That one is. Yes, it's absolutely, absolutely empty. Absolutely. Right, I shouldn't have done I it. I can you make on. the matches jump from that box, the one with the matches in, to the empty one, with one magic word. All right. Are you ready to watch? Mm. Okay, are you ready? Abracadabra! Uh, and now the matches are in that box. Let me show you. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> Not only that, I can make them go back. Right. I can, with the same magic word. Abracadabra! Now look, the matches are back there, and this one's now empty. <laughs> All right. Isn't that now, do amazing? It again. Do it again. Do Challenge. It again. Mm. Yeah. Quickly. Okay. Matches in that one. Nothing in that one. Abracadabra! Now right. that one has the matches. Now, hang on. Let's check this out. <laughs> you heard the matches. There's something badly wrong. I don't hear a thing and I don't see anything. Mm. Just, uh, give us your hand. Mm. I think he's got something up his sleeve, yes? Caught. A loaded matchbox. Mm. What a cheat. Try it on your friends. See, see you next, next week. Curiosity. Thank you.